sorry to be late this morning, but at least I'm mostly on time for what I'm supposed to be doing now. Um, one of the things that I thought I would talk about today is, obviously a lot of you got involved in this a little bit earlier than ComputerShare did. We've been at this now for about two years, and starting to see a lot of changes and developments and traction that's happening, which is interesting. Um, I do find that I'm still seeing an amazing amount of what I will call novice securities issuers who are really, really not prepared for or familiar with what's, in, what's involved in engaging in a securities offering. And I see a few of you snickering, so I think you've experienced this too. Um, I'm seeing that there are more, I guess, reality checks happening for companies. One of the things that I've observed is I think people engage in a lot of do-it-yourselfness in going about engaging in the crowdfunding space. So they read a lot of what's online. Um, personally, I try and read Sarah's blog to keep up with what's really going on. But I think that people read a lot of what's online, and I find that people reach out to us as a stock transfer agent way too early in the process. We try and ask them if they've acquired a good securities attorney yet, because that's really where they need to be in order to decide what kind of an offering they should, in, should be engaging in. I see Michael nodding his head. <laughs> um, so I think that there's still an amazing amount of investor education and issuer education that still needs to take place. We're starting to make some inroads on this in things that we're doing. Um, we've been running webinars. We've been you know, creating more content to put out there. And I would say that people in this room are, in fact, the, the ones that are actively engaging in this space. So I suspect that all of you are seeing some aspects of this. I think it's really important that we do a lot of that education and do a lot of that outreach and do a lot of collaboration in, in putting forth that kind of material because it really helps companies get on the right path. I've seen a few companies go down the wrong path. I, mean, I think we've all seen offerings that have been pulled, offerings that haven't met their minimums. Now we're starting to see more companies that are succeeding, which to me means that they've probably assembled the right professionals to help them. Um, and that is really such a big part of this. There's also a lot of changes going on in terms of blurring the lines between what used to be the traditional public space and what used to be the traditional private space. Now we have this stuff that is sort of straddling that line that used to be pretty firmly drawn in the sand. So now I see private companies that are DTC eligible. I see companies that want to DWAC shares, even though they're private. Um, we see companies pairing up with broker dealers and boutique investment banks instead of funding portals. You see fintech companies trying to pair up with somebody in the traditional space like broker dealers or investment bankers. There's a lot going on here. And a lot of you are engaged in pieces of this. I think in terms of trying to keep things on the right path, um, it really helps to have a healthy ecosystem. Um, I think the people in this room are generally part of that ecosystem. Um, and I think that the talk that we just heard about legislation, it's probably incumbent upon most of us to try and, through CFPA or through other trade organizations, to put forth agendas that will further a healthy ecosystem for continuing to grow. Um, and I think there's a tremendous amount of potential here. This is a cheaper, faster, better route for many companies. And the burden of corporate governance isn't quite as onerous as it is for public companies. So I think there's a lot to be done in the future. I think for us, what's happening now um, is we're still seeing a lot of um, issuers that need education, issuers that need to really think through with the help of professionals, whether it's their accounting firm or their law firm, or sometimes us, what, do, what are they really trying to accomplish and how? and what's the best way to go about that, and what part of the JOBS Act might be the best fit. Um, and maybe it's not a good fit. Um, I know that I have one friend in this space who will say pretty often that you don't choose Regulation A, it chooses you. And I think there's a pretty abundant stack of evidence for that. 
and I think it will continue to play out that way because I personally don't see any companies doing Regulation A plus or even Regulation A offerings that are what I would call startup companies. In the main, they have a track record. They have a real business. They're not really startups. However, many of them have not, other than doing the friends, family, and fools round, many of them have not done a lot of raising of capital from outside investors. From my standpoint, one of the bigger problems I see is people are really unprepared for both the cost in terms of money and resources to support their investor communications. It sounds great to say I'm going to do a $10 million raise with a $100 minimum, but do you realize how many investors that translates into? And just because you'd like it to be cheaper to service those investors doesn't mean that it is because there's a cost in doing that type of outreach. And when people give you their money, they kind of want to know what's happening with their money and therefore what's happening with the, your company. So you need to be prepared to support that if you're going to go to the public markets. And that's one of the things that I see that a lot of issuers have not really come to grips with. And now I'm seeing that people are trying to evaluate more, should my minimum be higher? Because if my minimum is $1,000 or $2,500, my average investment is going to be higher than that amount, and therefore my number of investors is going to be substantially smaller. Um, but again, however many of them you have, whether it's 20 or whether it's 20,000, you have to be prepared to communicate with them and you have to be prepared to do it efficiently. The last thing I'll say, because there are a number of lawyers in the room, I don't think any of you are guilty of this, but I'm sure there's a lot of lawyers that are. I still see companies that they come in, they want to do book entry, and the first thing I say to them is, is it in your offering memorandum that you don't have to issue certificates? And surprisingly, a high percentage of the time, it says they're on the hook for paper certificates. So if they come early enough, usually that can be changed. I have one that's scrambling to change it right now. Um, because issuing paper, if your intention is down the line to make things easier, more convenient, and cheaper for yourself as an issuer and for your investors, paper's not the good way to go. That is not the good path. So I'm still seeing a lot of that. I'm not sure whether we need to take out billboards on highways to make that more apparent to people, but nobody ever wants to pay the surety bond to replace the lost certificate that they insisted on getting five years ago when they invested in the startup. So it's not pretty. I'd also really love to find an attorney that thinks it's OK to just cancel all the certificates that were issued previously, because that is also a request that I seem to get with um, a little bit frightening frequency. It's like, well, I've got all these certificates. Can't I just cancel them and do this new stuff? I said, well, you can ask your counsel about that. I'm not an attorney, nor do I play one on TV. But last I heard, and I've heard about five opinions on this, that's not allowed. But you can take a try at it. And if you find an attorney that will give you an opinion, I'd like their name. So you know, I still see a lot of challenges in this space as we move towards more electronic trading trading and holding of these shares. Um, but it is definitely a growth industry. There's a lot of growth in this area. So the, the better infrastructure that we can develop, the better standards and better ecosystem, that will be better for all of us in the long run. And it will be much better for the businesses that are trying to run on this capital and continue to grow with it. So, Anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, Jean. into DTC? Yeah. That depends to a large degree on how things have been set up and handled prior to the shares getting to the transfer agent many times. Let's assume you've done everything perfectly. Is it a difficult process? It can be, depending upon where the shares are going. Because sometimes what you find is with smaller brokerage firms, this isn't an asset they recognize if it's a newly traded stock. So there's some definitely some spade work that needs to be done. Quite frankly, I've learned more about DTC operations in the past two years than I have in the prior 20. And I didn't necessarily want to know all of it, but I now know a lot more than I did before and more than I ever wanted to. So there are some challenges in that. Um, you know, we do do a lot of situations 
We've had actually a number of emerging bankruptcy clients in the past year, which tells me that the economy is looking a little better than it used to. Um, and many of them have involved their private companies, but many of them have involved direct DWACs upon closing. And those have been successful. We, by and large, able to do that. Um, most of the current Regulation A plus clients that we have who are live are not trading shares. Um, I have one upcoming that we've been digging into the DTC and brokerage world to make sure that the shares will go where they're supposed to go when they need to go. So I do think that part of that is the broker-dealer world, by and large, is really not very engaged in this space. There are some broker-dealers that are, but broker-dealers engaged in alternative investments are not all that thick on the ground. Um, so it's in part, it's an education process. And we still see, I mean, we had a situation recently where someone was calling in from a brokerage firm, but the shares were actually in street name, and they were wanting to move them to registered name, and the um, investor's broker couldn't figure out how to do that and wanted us to do it, and we're like, we, we can't initiate that. You have to initiate it. So there's challenges on, on really all sides of the fence, because this is all that back office stuff, I always say, it's not very glamorous, but it's a living. Um, but it is not a world that most people are familiar with, so it's pretty arcane for a lot of folks, and it takes some explaining. Anybody else? Jean was the only brave one. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you.